and I give the floor uh, to our first speaker, uh, Michał Bobrzyński. Uh, thank you very much, Wojtek. Uh, hello, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Michał Bobrzyński. I'm currently a partner in the Warsaw office of Greenberg Traurig uh, in Warsaw, where I am uh, part of the M&A and corporate team. Uh, uh, my origins are at uh, Jagiellonian. Uh, I graduated from Jagiellonian at, in, in the year 2005. And follow, as part of my uh, curriculum uh, back at Aguilanian, I, of course, uh, completed and graduated from the American law program, but not only from the American law program, but I also completed the German law program and the Austrian law program. Uh, uh, Wojtek, I would just have one, maybe one organizational request and maybe one, one request to the other participants, if you could please uh, mute your microphones because there's a lot of background noise, which is actually quite disturbing. And if you're not speaking, maybe also switch off your camera. That would be helpful as well. Uh, so that as, as part of my studies, I had some, I had quite a lot of exposure to both American law and German law, Austrian law. Uh, those were the only foreign law programs available at that time uh, when I was at law school. Uh, following that, I spent some time in Germany, both at the University of Heidelberg uh, uh, pursuing the PhD program, as well as working for the European Central Bank uh, in Frankfurt am Main in a quite uh, quite international setting, and those three uh, three uh, events or three uh, focal points were kind kind of triggering events for me to apply for an LLM at Harvard Law School. Uh, I was enrolled. I joined I joined Harvard in two thousand eight graduated in 2009 and as I followed the path of, of that most of the LLMs do in the United States, I sat for the New York bar exam in 2009. I successfully passed this exam. I took uh, the oath of admittance and uh, since 2010, I'm a member of the New York uh, New York Bar. Uh, I have never intended or I have never uh, thought of myself as being a Polish lawyer practicing in the United States. I have rather uh, intended from the beginning uh, to move back to Poland and practice in Poland in a Polish law settings. Following my following following Harvard, following the New York bar exam, I came back to Krakow. I started to work at at, uh, at a law firm in Poland. And I followed like the normal uh, bar apprenticeship uh, and took the normal bar training uh, available to like, like every normal Polish student. What uh, I found to be quite distinguishing and quite uh, helpful in my case is that uh, I have been working primarily in international settings. Uh, I have uh, never per se been advising or, or, or uh, uh, pro providing legal counseling on the US law, but uh, we have vast majority of my practice is involves dealing with international clients, uh, involves uh, participating in international transactions, which are designed or set up in accordance to uh, some common international standards or, 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 or setups and follow uh, typically the same uh, path. The uh, New York bar exam uh, and my US experience uh, looking backwards, uh, I think, uh, was quite or is a quite a significant uh, factor or contribution which enables me to work in international settings, uh, work with uh, international clients on the international templates of documents, and in particular assist uh, US clients or Western European clients uh, in the transactions involving uh, projects. Uh, we have another participant who has not muted her microphone. Thank you. Uh, uh, in the international settings and advising even also in the issues of, of the Polish law. I think the key distinction that, uh, or the key advantage from, from uh, pursuing studies in foreign law, uh, in American law, or but, but it, it can also be English law or, or German law, is that it gives you a, quite a significant perspective on your domestic legal system. It allows you to think more critically about different approaches that might be taken by lawyers from other jurisdictions. 
and it also allows you to give you and it also allows you to to take like a fresh look or a more critical look at problem problem solving that you are exposed with and i have always considered to be a kind of deficiency of the polish legal education that the polish lawyers are primarily educated uh, in a kind of continental approach uh, uh, to uh, uh, solving a specific fact pattern or specific case by simply applying law as it as it currently is to facts uh, whereas uh, in particular in the common law system the education is focused more on uh, on law as a legal tool for solving some social or political uh, uh, problems uh, where you simply do not strictly limit yourself to the application of law to facts but you look at the legal system as a kind of tool or equipment that allows you to uh, to shape or change the the reality uh, this is uh, the studies in law are very often uh, supplemented or accompanied by other disciplines such as elements of psychology economics also mathematics uh, which in total are intended to equip you with with a kind of tool set for application in uh, real life and uh, such a such a mixture of uh, polish education and uh, with mixed with deep exposure on the us law and uh, other uh, legal system i think is a, a great combination which allows or facilitates a, a success in practice uh, in poland and allows you, you to work more efficiently uh, uh, also here locally uh, in Poland, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the legal system, which is principally applied, is uh, is Polish law. So that would be some sort of introduction on my end. I think I would pass floor now to Justyna. Uh, maybe Justyna, if you could give some more background, some some more information about your particular background. Uh, the situation with you, I think, is quite opposite because you're a Polish lawyer who started her career in Poland and then moved to the United States and is now practicing primarily as a U.S. lawyer uh, out there across the uh, pond. Michal, thank you so much for this introduction. First and foremost, let me greet everyone. It's such a pleasure to see you all. And thank you so much for, uh, Wojtek, thank you so much for putting this great event together. And then, again, having me as one of the panelists. Uh, Michal, very valuable comments. Thank you. I very appreciate it. And yeah, that is true. I was, I am a Polish lawyer who is licensed in addition to still having my, uh, my bar license in Poland active. I am licensed in the US, in particular, in, in the state of Illinois, and I have been practicing law as a I, I don't even know how to characterize myself because I should say as a US lawyer, but the truth is that I, I've been mostly working with foreign clients, uh, not only because of my European experience, but I think that because of being able to understand truly what European clients or foreign clients, as well as foreign attorneys with whom I have had the pleasure to work mostly when it comes to M&A transactions, I am capable of understanding what they are asking about because being coming from, from a non-common law jurisdiction and having my primary prime my initial JD A that I got from, from Wrocław University, I, I, I think that makes me much more aware of all those differences in legal systems as well as those as differences in legal perceptions. So this is why what I found particularly valuable was your comment about a different viewpoint that is taken by US lawyers when it comes to analyzing any sort of, of problem. So in addition to applying law as it is, they always the question that is being asked is what is a bigger context? What is a bigger context that we are looking at that particular particular issue? But I am getting ahead, uh, ahead of myself. So I know that today my main uh, role is to tell you my story, how it happened that I am where I am. And first and foremost, it wouldn't have happened had I graduated from the, uh, from the program, which I attended as um, when I was a student at the University of Wrocław. 
a, as a summer program. And then I, I decided to take, take it one step further and I joined the LLM program in... Ja tylko tak ścisłem. Aha. No, ale wiesz, to, to było fajnie, bo naprawdę wszyscy się nastawili, że ma być fajnie i miło, bo się długo nie widzieliśmy i mhm. właśnie w ogóle, tak. w ogóle, wiesz, to było takie właśnie... Mhm. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, it was very, było bardzo miło. Uh, so I graduated from the University of Wrocław. During my, my law school, I also attended uh, two law schools in Italy, uh, taking advantage of Socrates Erasmus program, Bari and Padova, which basically introduced me to looking at any kind of legal system from a different perspective. But back then it was still a European perspective, only a different country. So I graduated, started my articles uh, in Wrocław, started working as an attorney, started my academic career, and I, uh, I decided to pull the trigger and I, I joined the LLM program, which happened in 2003, I believe, uh, time flies. Uh, but at that point, I never intended, it, that it didn't even cross my mind that I could at any point move to the US and start practicing law. In the US, I didn't take the bar. I just finished, got my diploma and continued with my, with my Polish career, both as an attorney and as a law professor. Uh, however, as Woody Allen says, that life is what happens when we are busy making plans, uh, what happened to me was that when I was working on my post PhD habilitantia, I uh, applied for Fulbright scholarship, which I was unbelievably lucky to get awarded with. So this is how I ended up in Chicago in 2011, 2011 and 2012. And this is when my private life, life took a big turn. And this is how I ended up in Chicago for good in 2014. Uh, I did sit for the bar in Illinois not pursuant to the LLM program, not pursuant to my diploma, but pursuant to a rule 715 of the Illinois Supreme Court, which allows lawyers who are licensed in a foreign jurisdiction and who meet certain criteria, such as having practiced in a foreign jurisdiction for at least five years, being in good standing, and first and foremost, having education that would be comparable or that would constitute an equivalent of the USJD uh, to sit for the bar without without taking the without going to a law school so without having a USJD and this is what happened in my case uh, that process took seven months uh, it required a crazy number of like amount of paperwork uh, I needed to get recommendations from 10 different lawyers from uh, from the state of Illinois as well as I had to a, provide all the documents about my, my practice in Poland, the number of hours, clients, referrals, a, recommendations or, a, from clients and from my former supervisors. So, so it was a little bit overwhelming, but at the end of the day, it did pay off. I was admitted to sit, sit for the bar. I took the bar, I, I passed it, and this is how I started practicing law in the US. And another luck that I had was the job offer that I got from my firm, which is based in Detroit. In the US, uh, my firm called Miller Canfield has 21 offices. Uh, one is located in Chicago, and this is where I'm working. But in addition to that, uh, the firm has three offices in, Pol in Poland. Poland is our European hub. So, so this is how it all happened, meaning I was hired to work with European a clients coming to the US and many of them are, are Polish because of our Polish affiliation. And this is what I, I have been doing. I've been doing, I've been dealing with corporate law, mostly international corporate law because of that cross-border element as well as MA. So that is my story. So thank you very much, Professor Reagan, for, uh, for your presentation. Uh, and now we would uh, most uh, gladly I'll listen to the third uh, speech today uh, from uh, Dr. Ola Forkot. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ola uh, Horvat Campbell. Um, I'm Polish. I started on a very uh, regular path, uh, like most of you. I, uh, I was a student of the Jagiellonian University. 
I graduated in 2007, but then um, I, uh, I took a postgraduate position with the um, university in Austria, uh, Zwirtschaftsuniversität uh, in Vienna. And I was writing a comparative PhD um, comparing shareholders' rights after um, cha some changes that were introduced um, by a, a directive in 2007. So um, after three years, I moved back to Krakow, worked for Kubaskos Gertner, now it's Kaukowski. And um, uh, in 2010, I uh, participated in the LLM program. This is how I got my LLM. And initially, I also didn't want to move. Um, I started the apprenticeship. Uh, Michal Bobrzyński's dad graciously uh, agreed to sponsor me during my apprenticeship. And um, I didn't finish it because I moved to the United States also for personal reasons. Um, I uh, didn't have um, Houston as uh, Professor, Professor Reagan's um, experience. So I, and, and Texas uh, where, I'm, where I'm practicing was also not very open to foreign lawyers at the time. So I had to redo my JD and I went to a and School of Law um, in Fort Worth, Texas. Right, I mean, when I started, it was in a really highly ranked school. Now we're in top 50. Um, and, um, you know, three years of grueling work, um, law school in the United States it is, I find, way more competitive than, than it is in, in Poland. You have to show up for every, every lecture. Um, you cannot just skip or read the book later and take the exam. Um, there is a huge competition for uh, being on law review. Um, participating in different moot court competitions or mediation competitions, etc. And um, after I finished my JD in 2015, I started working for a mid-sized law firm that had offices in um, Dallas, um, Austin, Houston. So just a relatively, relatively good firm for for Texas. Um, but unfortunately, they. Uh, declared bankruptcy eight months into me practicing law and I had to figure something out and I opened my own practice and um, obviously I don't have the um, power to lift uh, multi-billion uh, MNAs but I uh, but I advise some um, small mid-sized businesses individual clients and um, my comparative uh, corporate law PhD is maybe not as useful as I hoped it to be when I started out. But, you know, even, even recently, I had some people who, who wanted to probate an estate uh, with uh, assets in Germany and assets in, in Texas. And um, I was able to understand their legal need. I, I wanted, you know, to make sure that um, one person that was cut out under the will would not get um, under German law, Zachowet, um, which you know from um, you know Poland as well, um, but you know th this institution does not exist in the in, in the U well in Texas, so I was able to just tell them like okay let's let's go this route. Uh, you know this morning I had some medical um, professionals in my office um, asking me to form their entities and asking me some for some other advice. Um, Later today, I will be uh, registering trademarks uh, for some of my friends who started working with my law firm. Uh, I'm providing those services to smaller firms in, in Poland. And they are sending me uh, work that they cannot necessarily provide because they are not licensed in, um, in the US. So, I mean, there is a, an international component to my practice, um, but it's definitely limited and not as, not as um, uh, not as big as um, Mr. Bobzinski's and Ms. Uh, Reagan's. That, that's it. I mean, if, yeah, well, questions will be later, I guess. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I haven't seen any questions on the chat yet. Uh, I'm not so sure whether it's because there are uh, no questions yet, uh, or rather whether because uh, there are some problems with accessing the chat, which sometimes take place on Zoom. So if anyone is willing to, to ask uh, any of the speakers uh, for some more comments, for some more um, uh, remarks, uh, please do either or chat or, uh, or orally, uh, feel free to do this. 
uh, right now. Maybe before the questions appear, maybe I can add a few words about the uh, admittance oh. process in the United States, okay. because uh, you still not touched base on that here, Ola, as well. And uh, so the issue is that uh, when we are working in European yeah. Union, <clears throat> uh, uh, we are used to the fact that our credentials and our bar admissions can be recognized in other EU member states. Uh, this is not really the case in the United States. In the United States, as you know, it's com are composed of 50 separate states, which are actually 50 separate uh, jurisdictions. And they all, of course, speak the same language, which is English. And they are based on the same constitution, uh, uh, or at least the, on the federal constitution, have shared the same federal legal system. But each of those states has separate admission rules. There are two states which are typically, so to say, targeted by foreign applicants, applicants in the United States. One of them is California on the West Coast, which actually has a very relaxed approach to bar admission process. I think you don't even have to graduate from a law school to sit for the for the California bar exam. But on the same at the same time, the, the bar exam in California is, I think, the most difficult one in the United States. On the other side of the country, in New York, uh, um, the requirements are for at least to, to be eligible for seat for the bar exam are more stringent than in California, but uh, uh, doable in that sense that they can be met by foreign applicants. Uh, unless you complete the uh, JD program, which is like the full three-year curriculum, uh, like a free, full three-year law school, uh, 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 type of education, uh, which most of the US students do, then you need to show to the bar uh, uh, bar examiners that you have completed a uh, law faculty outside of the United States. And you have also received a specific number of credit points from a law school on the territory of United States. That means that all programs admitted abroad or overseas, like in Europe, like all summer programs, et cetera, they, they, they do not count. So you have to go to the United States, you have to study law at a, a ABA accredited law school. And most of the law schools us are, are ABA accredited. Uh, you need to, uh, at the same time, you have to be careful uh, because you need to choose your courses wisely. Uh, in that sense that not all courses would be uh, would be recognized by the bar examiners as uh, allowing you to sit for the bar exam. So uh, it, typically what happens is that each law school uh, tells you upfront which courses would be recognized by the bar examiner. So if you take corporate law, securities, torts, contracts, etc., of course, those those courses will count. But if you if you go into like a more monographic courses, which are often available at law schools, they might not, not necessarily be recognized by the bar examiners as uh, allowing you to sit for the bar. So for example, if you take a course, let's say uh, law and music or something similar, that might not necessarily uh, help you to, to, to sit for the bar exam. Uh, you have to go through the admission process or the pre-screening process where your documents are being reviewed by the bar examiners. They are looking at your uh, foreign degree. They are looking at your uh, uh, like good standing, they are looking at your transcripts from the from the law school and the courses that you are currently taking at the law school, and at some point you receive uh, a letter saying that you are eligible to sit for the New York bar exam, and this gives you an opportunity, of course, to register for the bar exam, uh, 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 and uh, uh, upon the condition that, of course, that you will complete the courses that you that you that you indicated to the bar examiners as part of your US law school uh, curriculum. Uh, following that, there is a period of preparation for, for the actual bar exam. Uh, the bar exam in New York is administered twice a year uh, in late July. And in the winter, I think it's it's January or February. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what is, what is this, when, the second, uh, when the second exam takes place. So, Following the graduation from the law school, uh, which uh, which uh, takes place usually in the beginning or, or early in May, uh, uh, this launches a kind of bar exam preparation uh, preparation uh, schedule. Uh, 
most of the students uh, uh, take a bar review course, uh, which is uh, organized and offered commercially by one of the specialized service providers. Uh, I think still Barbary is the main uh, is the main or the, the or, or, or the or the is the company which is the, which is which is uh, most commonly chosen by the by the applicants. The bar review course offers you a comprehensive comprehensive review and preparation. Uh, for the bar exam based on the precedents uh, from the past years, based, based on the test questions from the past years, and also offers you like an introduction to all specific areas of law which are covered by the, by the bar exam. Uh, the bar exam takes place uh, at the end of June, uh, at the end of July. Uh, it's usually like a two-day exam, uh, which, uh, is, uh, which consists of the uh, of the uh, multi-state part, and the multi-state part is common for all 50 states. Uh, this is where essentially federal law is tested or some common principles of law are tested. And this is followed by the, uh, by the, uh, by the specific New York part or the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the part which is devoted to a specific state or, or specific jurisdiction. The multi-state part is essentially like a multi uh, uh, multi-question or uh, multiple choice test, uh, uh, which is addressing various areas of law, like torts, contracts, constitutional law, uh, elements of the federal law, administrative law, procedural law, etc. Uh, where you are, where you are facing, or based on the, on a specific fact pattern, like a small description of facts, you have to indicate like like the answer. Those questions are really tricky and difficult. It requires quite a lot of practice to first understand how those tests are being prepared and what to, you know what what you might be looking uh, looking for. Uh, so uh, it, it, this part is followed by uh, by uh, by by the by the part uh, dedicated to the uh, like in my case New York law where you essentially need to provide like a written responses to to specific fact patterns so you, you get like a small casus where you have to answer like provide your assessment and answer uh, the third part of the exam uh, is uh, essentially uh, working on a specific case file so you you receive like a pre, pre prepared case file concerning for example inheritance matter family dispute whatever the case may be uh, where you have to make like a like an assessment and prepare uh, like as uh, like an output that you are requested to prepare. This may be a court filing. This might be a draft of a testament. This can be a simple agreement. It it depends. So you you know you can be asked to prepare like a typical uh, uh, written product, uh, which you, which is typically typical for the for the for the work of lawyer but this can be either like an official document in form of an administrative decision judgment or pleading testament uh, agreement etc so so uh, you don't know it in advance what what, what type of instruction you will receive uh, those that this is the core part of the exam which is which takes place over the course of two days uh, in order to sit for the bar exam of course you need to first prove your eligibility and get the uh, letter clearing you or allowing you to sit for the for the exam based on your uh, credentials. Uh, this uh, two-day exam is supplemented by the third day, uh, which you can take in either in conjunction with the first two days or, or, or at a separate time, which is essentially an exam in professional ethics. Uh, this is again a multiple choice exam uh, where you are asking, I think, 50 or so questions concerning uh, uh, professional ethics problems again composed of small fact patterns, where you have to indicate what is the problem, what is the what is the correct approach or correct uh, correct uh, response. Uh, in short, uh, the, again we have someone who has not muted the microphone and we have echo. Um, in short, the Bar exam is quite a challenge. The preparation itself is quite quite challenging. I don't know what is the average passage rate among the foreign students currently. I think when I was taking the bar exam, it was something around 20% uh, in terms of people who are not US qualified lawyers sitting for the bar exam and taking the bar exam uh, first. Uh, I have 
you know, like several friends also who who, are, who had to repeat the exam because they failed in the first instance and 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 got a positive result only in the second or third uh, attempt. Uh, essentially, what uh, what uh, what uh, is useful and what is a kind of must approach is you need to take some bar review course. Uh, also, in particular, that uh, you as a for, or most of us as foreign lawyers are in the United States only for like a limited period of time. So essentially, you have no exposure to all areas of law which are covered by by the bar exam. Uh, so, uh, for example, I found it quite challenging uh, to uh, prepare for the bar exam in the areas of like real property or trusts because those areas of law are, are based on common law. They are not based on Roman law as or they, they do not follow the same principles as uh, as, the, as Polish law. We don't have the concept of trust at all in, in Poland. Uh, and it was quite challenging to, to to master that and understand it for the purpose of the bar exam. And again, the bar exam is not only about mastering the key concepts or, or the basic elements of law. Uh, the basic elements of law are tested in the law, in law school. For the purpose of bar exam, you have to master this from the from the practical point of view, where you are actually where your knowledge is actually tested in some practical settings and 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 uh, in practical. Uh, when faced with practical problems. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Michal, for your uh, answer. Uh, following the questions that were on chat, uh, maybe also uh, Dr. Campbell and uh, Dr. Reagan uh, could say a few words about how the bar exams uh, they took uh, look like. Uh, was it similar or different and different in uh, what ways? So from my perspective, it was similar. There are three days in Texas. Um, and we, in addition to the portion, uh, Ms. Dombkowska, please uh, mute yourself. Um, in addition to um, the two days that Mr. Bobrzyński was mentioning, we also had a third portion that is Texas specific. So this is you know, procedural uh, material law that is just tested what well, was tested for texas uh, only and then the ethics um, just because i had the freer program i could take on a different schedule so it didn't have to be like one additional day after the bar exam i don't know if anyone would survive this so students in texas just do it on a different schedule um, so it's spread out one thing that i kind of wanted to touch upon is the cost of taking a bar uh, abroad Especially when you look at the conversion rate nowadays, Polish lottery two dollars, like I think one to four or one to five, and um, all these all these different uh, programs like Barbary or Kaplan that you're taking to prepare for the bar, I consider essential. Like I, I don't think you can really pass the bar just by studying books. You have to take this program, and it's anywhere between fifteen. Um, one thousand five hundred to four thousand dollars, just you know, uh, to buy that component, and that that's you know on top of all the application fees, translations, and and all the other stuff. So that's something that you kind of need to prepare for when when planning on taking the bar abroad. Um, but I wanted to touch upon this question: um, what step, what steps uh, someone should take um, or considering after graduating uh, to work internationally as a lawyer? And um, I think that Jagiellonian has a really great offer of international schools. Um, I participated in the Austrian one, um, German and American one, and I found them extremely useful. Uh, they will allow you to think more creatively, put it on the resume and hopefully get into the areas of law that are more international, like m and arbitration, you know, you can uh, look at different grants that are opening up as you are graduating um, and see um, if there are any research institutions that would be looking for postgraduate assistance or, um, or people who would, who would get into certain area and, and work that for maybe a year or two and then um, tailor your application to the areas of international law that you're really interested in. And um, I mean, if you if you want to go abroad um, to, um, to to the U.S. to practice law here, I would really follow the money trail, meaning different coasts uh, tend to specialize in different geographical areas 
when it comes to international trade or international business. East Coast is typically more attuned to um, transactions with Europe. West Coast is more dominated by Asian transactions. And the South, like Texas, deals more with South America. Just in general, this is what people are trying to like this is how it's streamlined so to say when you're applying for jobs so for example my european experience wasn't that as as um recognized so to say as it would be in chicago when where there is a, a bigger um polish population and it's just kind of more on everyone's minds so um i would make sure that if i take a bar exam if i want to practice on this like intercontinental um route i would you know i would look at uh, bigger hubs um, in the US, like Chicago, like New York, uh, maybe Pennsylvania, um, just to see, you know, where there is that connection with, with Poland or with Germany, somewhere where your skills and understanding can be um, valued and, and used in everyday um, business. And then Okay, so maybe we can... Uh, yeah, how to, how to take the New York bar after LLM. Um, I don't think that L, the, I, I don't think that the LLM um, that the Catholic is offering in conjunction with the J, uh, Jagiellonian is going to allow you to take the New York bar. I think that has been answered multiple times. Um, just throughout my career as the director of the LLM program, and I think that that is Unless something changed recently, and this is more Mr. Bainchuk's question than me question, but um, I don't think that it allows you to sit for the bar um, in New York. It will. It will. I think it will not allow you, and I think nothing has changed in that respect. The issue is that, I, as I mentioned, uh, you need to, in order to sit for the New York bar exam, you need to have a certain amount of credit points received from the U from a U.S. law school. Of, I think for foreign applicants, it's roughly 20, 24, something, something like that. But those credit points need to be earned in the United States. And the LLM that JU is offering with the Catholic is composed of two parts. The first part is the is taking place in Poland, and that part obviously does not count. And the second part uh, is that uh, US is, a, is the summer in Washington, where you also do some additional courses and uh, prepare like a thesis, and that part would count. But that part, I think, is not enough in terms of the number of credits that you receive uh, to receive the eligibility to sit for the bar. I think as a rule of thumb, you should assume that you need to go to the United States at least for one full academic year or calendar year to be able to receive the sufficient number of credit points that would give you the eligibility to sit for the, for the bar exam in New York. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Michał and uh, Ola for your, for your answers. And I would most gladly uh, ask uh, Professor Reagan uh, also to, to answer about uh, her experience with the Illinois bar exam. And what Ola said about uh, Illinois, Chicago specifically, New York, and potentially Pennsylvania being places where Polish law could be put to use, I do agree with it, but with how to say it, uh, don't come to the US to practice Polish law. That's not going to happen. There are some Polish lawyers who are uh, practicing Polish law uh, in Chicago in particular, and who are admitted by the Illinois Supreme Court as foreign lawyers. But what they are, what they are doing is basically limited to social security, uh, meaning uh, emeritore, uh, and this kind of so 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 that is not that is a very limited scope of practice if this is what you are planning or in, in other words if you are planning on practicing corporate law the chances that you will be able to practice polish corporate law or any kind of european corporate law on american soil are are very remote if if existing at all uh, when it comes to the illinois bar exam I completely agree with what both Ola and Michal said, meaning taking the bar without a, taking that preparation course. And yeah, the one that I took is Barbary. 
I, I cannot even imagine that. Because it's not only about, about the, the knowledge that you have to familiarize yourself with, but it's in my case, it was much more about the, the format of the of the of the exam, which is so foreign to European students, or I should probably talk about myself, was so foreign to me. So the first day, the Illinois bar exam uh, lasts for three days. The first day is a test, uh, which covers federal law, like seven areas of federal law, which is torts, contracts, civil procedure, then criminal law, criminal procedure, constitutional law. I'm missing something. maybe six areas of law, whatever. So the test is composed of 200 questions and you have 90 minutes to complete those. You are doing, I, I, I was doing it on my laptop, so I needed to download a specific, soft, specific software and that is a, a single choice, a test. Yet the way the questions are phrased are so different from the way I was being taught in Europe meaning those questions are not theoretical. Those questions are asking about certain legal principles that are put into practice, meaning you have a very short, in most cases, you have a very short, like two or three sentence description, a sentence long description of, a, of facts, and you have to apply law to the facts that were provided, meaning you cannot memorize those rules because if you memorize the rules, the, you, it, it wouldn't help you uh, when it comes to passing that exam. You simply have to comprehend those rules and you really have to be very familiar with the mechanisms and very often uh, you have to be aware of the rationale behind those rules because that test, that first day of the bar exam really tests not only your knowledge but also your your the way you think and whether you understand what you were what you were learning. So. So for me, that preparation course was first about the law. So those rules that are being condensed and presented to you. Uh, and also the, the course covers uh, not everything when it comes to each area of law, but those um, issues that are asked about more frequently during bar exams. But again, it's condensed, but first and foremost, it teaches you how to decipher or how to unpack those questions that are being asked to you. So that was probably the most challenging part of the bar exam for me. And I think that if anything took me the longest, it was getting that the confidence uh, when it comes to that different format of, of the exam. And then the second day was about a it was focused on essays, both state-specific and federal-specific. And again, when it comes to the essays, again, it's the same thing as with the test. It's about the format. You have to know how to phrase those essays, how to write them. You always start with presenting the question, meaning rephrasing the question that was asked to you, and then you are describing the facts, then you are applying the, the rule, uh, the law, and then you are drawing a conclusion. So completely different way than you would approach those essay questions from a European perspective. And uh, to follow up on what Ola said, uh, when I was, I attended Barbary in person uh, because I also wanted to interact with the teachers. So I remember that at the court of, uh, at the course of tort law, which for me was really, I, I don't know why, for me that was probably the most challenging part of the bar exam because torts in the US were completely different than in Europe. So this is why for me it was so counterintuitive. But I remember approaching the teacher uh, or the professor uh, and I asked whether he believed that it would be beneficial for me when during the bar exam to maybe add some European component uh, saying, okay, so just so you know, in the in the in Europe, that question would be answered in this and that way. I I, re I will always remember the look that he gave me, and he said, hmm, "You are overthinking it. Don't do it. You won't have the time. And if you and even if you do it, 
it's not like you will impress anyone because people who will be grading your your essays have no idea about European law. So they will not be able to to say whether the answer that you provided or that additional the component of your answer is even correct. So don't bother, don't bother, which was so disappointing for me because I really thought that that would make me different, that would add some additional flavor to my answers, but it didn't work out. So, so just so you know, uh, attending the Barbary uh, or any kind of bar preparation exam is absolutely fundamental, yet it's expensive as it was said before. Thank you very much. Uh, also, like following one of the questions asked, which were partly answered by, by Michal about the possibilities to take the uh, New York uh, State Bar exam and generally becoming a lawyer after graduating from the American Law Program and the LLM program. Uh, still, uh, the answer was negative, uh, but still, all of you graduated from the American Law Program. Uh, all of you hold the LLM title. So, how would you describe what was the influence uh, of those programs that you took in Poland? Uh, about American law to your future career as, as an American lawyer? Okay, well, since I'm an American lawyer, I can answer this question. Um, you know, I, I did redo the entire law school, right? So um, being able to see how law is taught um, during the um, uh, CUA program, was really fundamental for me because it gave me the advantage over other um, students whenever I got into law school. Um, I will already had a couple of drafting uh, courses. I I knew, you know, how to read cases um, because that's you know that's not something that was necessarily taught at Jagiellonian at the time. Um, I really liked and, and profited from kind of more hands-on approach. Um, of the American education. And so whenever I got to law school, um, I knew exactly what to expect. Um, uh, and, and I already had a leg up, so to say. Uh, but even, even when I, it, you know, whenever I was um, taking that L LLM, I was not necessarily planning on moving to the United States. Um, I still, I mean, I still really liked um, everything that I was taught. I didn't even like, thought that I would ever try to get licensed in the US. Um, and LLM gives you a really good perspective of other legal systems. Whether you want to be a researcher, um, an academic, um, it gives you a really good basis. Um, and um, if you want to practice, it kind of opens up your mind um, and makes you more creative when you are trying to come up with different solutions. And it also kind of sets up some kind of a threshold for expectation. Um, you know that a legal document, even if you prepare it in, in Poland, is going to be vastly different than the one that you would prepare for an American client. So I think that these are the like the most important parts of the LLM program that you can that you can have um, that will prepare you for working with foreign clients. Mm, thank you. Michael, will you follow up here? I would, um, I would describe my uh, experience with the American Law Program as a kind of mind opening. And I highly encourage every one of you to take part in the American Law Program and possibly pursue the LLM if possible at, uh, as well. Uh, I think the American Law Program gives you a very good flavor of what it is to study law in the United States. It gives you a very good overview of the key areas of law. And first and foremost, it gives you an introduction to the American methodology of teaching law and to the materials that the US students are typically working with when they are studying for the, for the exam. <clears throat> Doing the LLM on the top of the American Law Program is not a big effort in terms of time. This is something you can, I think you can still do primarily when being as when being enrolled as, as, a, as a law student uh, um, in the law school. And uh, uh, the advantage of doing the LLM is that gives you a kind of academic title on the top of the American law program, which you can then use in your career. And first and foremost, but it's also important that doing the LLM at the Catholic University in collaboration with the Aguilonian does not prevent you from pursuing another LLM in the United States. So uh, it will give you 
certainly good foundations, good starting point, good understanding, or at least uh, understanding what to expect uh, when uh, dealing with American lawyers and American academics. But it will in no case harm your chances to uh, do like a, like a full-time LLM uh, later on in your career or later on in your education at the American university. So I would highly encourage you to do uh, at least the American law program to get like a flavor or introduction to American law taught by the American professors in the in the US type of uh, inter or, and and taught in the US using like the US method. Sometimes it's Socratic method. Sometimes it's like a normal, more regular type of lecture. But I think you can get it for uh, quite a modest fee in Poland, in Krakow. And this is like a certainly like an advantage uh, but uh, this is something that you can combine with your like regular course of students this is studies at Jagiellonian. Well, thank you very much. And also Regan, could you follow up on this? Um, similarly to, to Ola. Ola, we have so many, like so many, there are so many similarities between our, our professional uh, resume. So I didn't plan when I first took or a, a applied for the summer law program as well as the LLM. I didn't plan on moving to the US. I didn't even consider it. It never crossed my mind at that time. And the main reason why I decided to do it was to boost my resume, to be completely blunt with you. I thought that having a title from a US school would distinguish me from other candidates when it comes to looking for job, especially when it comes to looking for a job with a foreign law firm. And honestly, it paid off instantly. So that was one of the best investments in my entire life. Not to mention or notwithstanding what happened to me later and my and where, where I ended up. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's a good moment to close the recording session. And at the same time, the, the official part of our meeting uh, but still our speakers have generously agreed to stay for uh, like a half an hour more so that we can have a private discussion and then you are most uh, gladly asked to uh, ask your questions and giving your comments uh, orally with cameras so we can have like a private something which we uh, during uh, offline meetings you would call like a coffee session or, or something maybe with your own coffees uh, at hand. Uh, so thank you very much for the for all of your presentations and careful answers to, to all the questions. Thank you for all questions asked, uh, and I'm looking forward to to our next meetings. Uh, right now I close the recordings.